All right, last time we talked about some of our conceptual ideas of the coast and, and, and sort of this idea of management. Um, I'm gonna have a, I have a, a recorded um, screencast that I want you guys to watch. That's one small example, one small story of um, how the coastal zone can interact and play in these, these interesting ways. So I'll, I'll have that up for you guys, you guys can watch that. But what I want to talk about right now to sort of finish our initial intro before we can get into specifics is talk a little bit about this notion of the coast. What do we mean by the coast geographically? The conclusions of this, the take home, the take homes from our discussion today are right here. This, this slide and the next one, I'll show you at the very end too. But in case you go catatonic and, and, are, and we're asleep uh, for most of this lecture. Um, so the key take homes are that um, most of our civilizations largest cities are on the coast. Generally the ones that are on the coast, the, the few that, that aren't there are on some major river or some, some great lake or inland sea or something. But, 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 uh, but most of our concentrations of dense human beings are on the, what we would call the coastal zone, in the coastal zone. And associated with that, the greatest density of people, if we look just across the planet, is going to be right there in the coastal zone, right there next to the water. <clears throat> These next couple bullets will come out over the next several weeks and things, but just since we're talking about what is the coast, just to make sure we have the same frame of reference, um, these bands of usually a political unit, in our country we typically talk about counties, but these, these political jurisdictions next to the coast, which as you'll see are one of the ways in which we define, we can define the coastal zone. These groups of these things, which people sometimes call seaboards, meaning all these counties next to each other, next to the, to the ocean, are really intense areas of economic and cultural activity. In our country, it's particularly so on the west coast, um, the Atlantic, especially the, the northeastern Atlantic coast, and then the Gulf Coast. Um, that's where a huge amount of the activity that drives what we call the American enterprise occurs. And while we're not wholly distinct from the rest of our country, there are clear patterns and aspects of a whole variety of our society that, that take on a different form in the coastal zone versus in more inland areas. And so that's in terms of de demography, that's in terms of people's movement patterns, that's in terms of economic exchange, uh, and, and it goes on and on and on. Laws, uh, environmental conditions, et cetera. Oh, let, me, let me fix these lights a little bit for you guys, please. The last ones are more specific. Um, we're gonna talk about people today and, and, and how we define, wh where we define the coastal zone to be. But one of the most important factoids, I think, is that in this coastal zone, however we want to define it, there's more people alive right now, just in that, that narrow strip around the water, than were alive on the entirety of planet Earth in the 1950s. And, and this is only intensifying. The proportion of people that are at the coast is going up. So this isn't just a stagnant pattern that's been here forever and ever. It, uh, it, it does seem to be intensifying around the world. Is, is a little hard depending on wh which calculation, which formulation, which data set we're looking at. But in general, we can pretty safely say about a billion people worldwide live in the coastal zone. Right? So, so something on the order of one-seventh or so, or a little bit less than one-seventh or so of our planet lives at the coast, when the coast is a very, very, very small sliver of the total livable space on this planet. Just for some numbers, the most widely quoted number, which would be the, our last U.S. Census, which was 2010. We do them every 10 years, right? So 2010, and then the estimate for 2020, and that is about 123 people lived in, um, in this case, what we call coastal counties um, uh, in, in 2010. And that was, that was a bit more than one-third of all the humans living in the U.S. lived there. And it's going to go, it, it is go, it's already gone up from there, but the estimate is something on the order of 130, 140 million people come uh, three years from now. 
living in these coastal zones. So those are some good numbers to know. So 1950s population is crammed in our, in our coasts. Uh, about a billion people right now, if you want to use some kind of number. And in the U.S., we're talking somewhere between uh, 130 and 140 million right now are living in a coastal county. Cool? All right. Don't go to sleep, but if you have to go to sleep, remember those things. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this stuff. California. When I was, when I, I grew up in San Francisco Bay Area, I grew up in Northern California. Is anybody else from Northern California? I can't remember. A couple? Okay. What was, what was, what's the, what was the thinking of Southern California? Any, any thoughts? Surfer dudes, good. Anything else? I feel like there's always the attitude, like one's better than the other. But... Totally. Yeah. Totally. Those, those expletive deleted Southern California people. So, where I, where I formed my first opinion of, I mean, Southern California is also where Disneyland was, so that wasn't totally evil, but, but um, I really, it really was driven home in my mind from my family when. We were having one of our uh, droughts and one of our energy crises, which you guys are probably too young to remember. And it was always, got to conserve, man. Conserve water, conserve energy, and all this and that. And we had to put bricks uh, in our toilet bowls, you know, so that we wouldn't have as much water volume in there. Then you'd use a facility, shall we say, and then there wouldn't be enough water. You'd have to flush it a lot. So anyway, um, uh, we, there's always these factoids every couple months, like you guys, like we just experienced in our most recent drought which is every month or so, the state would publish, oh, we've saved X amount of water compared to the previous year or the previous last couple of years. And it was always, you know, San Francisco, San Jose, Marin County, Contra Costa County, Sacramento, they saved like 23% reduction in water, 33. And then it was LA, 2%, you know? <laughs> and, and all our friends were like, it's, it's chill, dude, it's good. And, and so there's always this, those bastards, they're always taking the water, you know, there's kind of this thing. So, so and I, I went to, I did my PhD at UCLA, but I actually worked at a USC facility, and my uh, in-laws might have gone to USC. Um, and so there's always this kind of weird rivalry, and, and that's how I think Northern California, Southern California is. There's always this rivalry, but when there wasn't sports going on, at least for me, it, UCLA, it was, okay, whatever, these guys are cool, let's go do something. USC people are always like, you bastard, UCLA, you bastard, UCLA, right, no matter what time of year it was. And that's, that was kind of like what I remember the, the people's conceptualization of California was in the 70s and the 80s. Northern California were really ticked off at Southern California. Southern California was like, it's chill, dude, what's cool, well, I love you, you know. <laughs> and, so, and so this was really, you know, it was really this thought of the North versus the South. And so political opinion and, 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 and popular culture, the kind of sweatshirts you wore, it was always this, this Northern California, Southern California uh, breakdown, at least in Northern California it was that way. But the reality is that's not true. That, that, that's, that's uh, you know, that there might have been reasons why people initially thought that, but this is the real story of California. The real breakdown of California, if we want to understand it, is coastal versus inland. Everything tracks with that, or virtually everything. A, a, a large, large number of things track with that. So, for example, the vast majority of our population, the vast majority of our voting age population in the coastal zone. The folks inland, um, much, lo much lower densities, not as many... Um, voters, et cetera. And these are just three things that, that we might look at with our poll data if we want to. But this is on the la this is from the um, uh, Public Policy Institute of California. This is some survey opinion polling uh, uh, data from a few years ago. But it serves to make the point, the, the colors, the, actually the questions don't even really matter that much. The one on the left is attitude towards uh, what we should do about global warming. The one in the middle is should we continue to do offshore drilling or do more offshore drilling. And the one on the right is, what do we think about how our government's doing? But you don't even really need to look at those questions. You can just look at the color patterns. And you see that the coast is on average one color. The stuff inside is on average another color. And this tracks with everything. This tracks with income higher in the coast. 
this tracks with educa educational attainment, highest level of education completed, higher on the coast on average. Political parties, uh, uh, just I mean, you name it, TV watching behaviors, whatever. There really is this coastal versus inland. And so this old notion of north versus south is at best a distraction and at worst um, something that can lead us astray when we try to think about building coalitions and try to think about doing effective management. <clears throat> so here's, here's that old breakdown. This is Northern California versus Southern California. This is, in, sorry, the, on the left is 1900 going up to 2000. This is 100 years of our state's history. And we can see the breakdown in just number of human beings that existed in California. We start off with mu much of us being in San Francisco slash Sacramento, the power the traditional power centers uh, and population centers and economic centers of our state. And as we go through time, LA, the, the greater Los Angeles area basically comes online. And there's a bunch of reasons for this. You could take uh, our water resources management class or whatever and learn about what we did to the water system, et cetera. But, but suffice it to say, Northern California has not been the dominant population area of our state for quite some time. This is the better uh, illustration. Again, same exact time period. So 1900 to 2000. And we saw that relatively large change, right, in terms of northern versus southern as, as more uh, development and housing and things like that, water supply came on. But you don't really see that in terms of coastal. Coastal has always been the place to be. Maybe they are coastal up north, maybe they're coastal down south, but the real pattern is coastal versus inland. Now, let's talk about, is that cool? Question so far? Yeah. Oh, would you say that um, the coastal counties are um, taking water, like drinking water resources from inland? Like sure they are. So the question is, yeah, so, so are, are, is the blue sucking resources from the yellow? And the answer is, of course it is. We can't support that density of people and that, that, that infrastructure, whatever, just solely on that little strip of land. It's very productive in terms of biological productivity, et cetera, but nevertheless, there's so many people there. Um, we need to import stuff from, from outside. All of our urban centers, all of our dense concentrations of, of humanity need resources from, from outside, so that's definitely true. So let's talk about, at, the, at this point, the conceptual picture of what we mean by the coastal zone, broadly writ. We, talked, we touched on this last time, but just want to do it again. Firstly is to say this is a three-dimensional thing, right? We're talking about the air, we're talking about the depths of the ocean, we're talking about all this and that. And so when we say the coastal zone, we mean that, you should mean that. But in most practical senses, when we talk about this, we're trying to um, take a management action or assess a resource, we usually kind of default to the two-dimensional view just to delineate the area. And then we just go straight up in the atmosphere, straight down into the water or, or ground as, as the case may be. Shoreline, coastline, mostly you can use those interchangeably, right? I, I won't get up in your grill about that. But for the purposes of today, we should maybe use a little bit more precise terms. And so I'll define shoreline in a second. But suffice it to say the shoreline is, is the immediate where the water hits the land, the, the, the linear feature. The coastline is the area next to that. So again, for most, of, most intents and purposes, most expository writing you're going to do, broad descriptors, you could use them interchangeably. But, um, but shoreline is the actual line that we could draw at some, some point on the two-dimensional map that is where the aquatic and terrestrial areas meet. As we said before, we're going to define the coastal zone for the purposes of our class, for most of our conceptual discussions and talking about management, et cetera, um, in, in this broad framework, which is by coastal zone, we're going to mean in our class the terrestrial area that directly influences, and by influences, I mean could be physical materials that could go, it could be energy that is exchanged, but, but something, one of those two things, um, is directly going from the terrestrial area into the oceanic realm and, and vice versa. One easy way 
to think about the terrestrial area is, is, as I said before, these coastal watersheds. So, so water is the most obvious material it's going to transport, water and, and, and soil eros erosive materials, et cetera. And those are really driven by watersheds. And again, the ocean area is just the part that's going to directly influence the land. Now, that's great for our conversations and our, and our, our thinking, et cetera. But oftentimes, we have to put some kind of boundary on you know, exactly what do I mean by directly influences. You know, let's be more specific. So first, I want to do a little um, sidestep and, and talk about what we mean by shoreline. Shoreline, again, is this, uh, you could also think of it as the waterline. But as you guys all know, we have tides, right? So the water isn't just still. Our, because our planet is rotating and we have moons and we're going around the sun, we have these tidal forces, and the, the land is fixed, or basically fixed. This liquid water is sloshing around on top of that baseball of a, of a planet. And so that water sloshes up higher sometimes, it goes down sometimes, it goes lower sometimes. So um, while there are different... Actually, let me step back. So, okay, we, we have three different types of, um, three broad categories of tidal cycles on our planet. At the top of the, actually start at the bottom. The bottom is diurnal. And this guy right here, a tidal day, this would be um, basically when you think of a, a day, it's not exactly 24 hours, but you know, we're talking about the course of the sun coming up, the sun going down kind of thing. Um, you, we could have it where we have essentially one high tide, one, one, one high level of water one low level of water, and that's known as a diurnal tide. So it's, a, it's one cycle? It, it, yeah, so, like one. Yeah, so there's okay. one high, one low. So the way this particular figure, it makes it a little teeny bit complicated, okay. but if we can imagine if we shifted this just to here to here, right, we'd have just one high, one low. Uh, Semi-diurnal is, um, we, have, we have a couple of those um, in so if we look at that right here, if this is our tidal day, look, we got two lows, two periods of, of lowered water. The most important one is what we, what we have, what mu much of the planet has. It's called mixed semi-diurnal. So it's this thing. We have a high and a low, but the, the high is usually fairly different. The two highs are fairly different from one another. The two lows are fairly different. So we have a higher high each day, a lower high each day, a higher low each day and a lower low each day. Everybody with me? So this is, this is what we have here on our California coast, and this is what we have in, in much of the, around much of the globe. And so if you look at that, we can see, okay, we have a high, we have a low, et cetera. And then seasonally, this is going to be going up and down, depending on how we're, we're going through the, our orbits. And so um, not only is this happening on a, not only is it changing on a day-by-day -day basis, but as we go through the seasons. When we get to what's known as uh, the period of spring tides, or when the tides are the highest, um, sometimes you hear these referred to the highest of the highs as king tides. Um, we could, uh, okay, so if we just look at this picture, this is complex. So when I say the line of water, and, and in some places, if we're in Louisiana or Hawaii, boring tidal places, right? The tide goes up a couple feet. And it's like, oh, that's not interesting. Here, you know, we can easily get six foot, you know, the, the high might be uh, six feet higher than the low. In other places of the world, it might be 14 feet. I mean, I mean, so it can vary a lot. So this notion of where do we pick? Where do we measure? What, what is the water line when it's, when it's varying every day? It's a non-trivial thing. And there's various entities that for various reasons use, use certain things. The most typical one that we use, uh, I would say in, in, in California, in, in much of the US, is this notion of mean higher high water. So what that means, without going into the specifics of the engineering parts of that, um, uh, you should take Dr. Patch's physical oceanography class if you want to learn more about that. But suffice it to say, we're going to go to those times when the water is high, and we're going to measure that high the highest of the high tides, and then we're going to average those together. And so that's the mean higher high water. Everybody with me? Okay. And so, so that's the thing that we're going to use to define the shoreline. And, and then that makes some point in, in the sand or on the rock where it doesn't matter where the waters are right now, we, we now know where that uh, particular location is. And now we can draw our bathtub ring around the coast of California or North America or whatever and, be and, and have a 
have a consistent language that we can all speak and we can all uh, translate that. Okay, so that's our shoreline. Cool. Now, we have our conceptual definition. We'll stick to that. But um, as we look through the literature on how many people live in the coastal zone and, and, and this and that, we find different definitions. There is no one single definition used by everybody across the planet. There's, there's, there isn't even necessarily a single definition used by different states in the U.S. So let's just uh, talk about those. They're basically, the way I think of these, they're broken down into three different broad categories. One is how far away you are from, let's say, the mean high or high water. So how far inland we can go, how far out to sea we go. We can do elevation-based measures. So how far above that what we call sea level, right, zero foot elevation, how far, how much higher to that, above that can we go? Or we can just have an arbitrary definition. The distance-based ones, so say 50 kilometers in, 100 miles in, or whatever, and then just make a buffer and then look at all the resources, all the people, all the whatever it is within that, that coastal zone. That's usually uh, a, a, and I should also say that many of the definitions of a coastal zone will come from the entity that's trying to answer a question. So they usually come at it with a perspective. So if you are someone who's worried about problems in the coastal zone, this is, this is a good one to use, right? Because this is going to be a good measure of how concentrated people are, how, how concentrated those activities are in a, in a specific spot. So something like how, how what's, what are the housing prices there? Are there places to live? Um, how much extractive activity are we doing? How much fishing is going on in these areas? Stuff like that. The elevation-based measures, as we're learning about this week and we learn about all the time increasingly in our changing world, um, is often, they're off, those are often about coastal hazards. Dr. Patch talks a lot about coastal hazards. So this is primarily flooding risk these days. So sea level rise, hurricanes coming in, et cetera, with the idea being that the higher an elevation, the less likely we are to flood, or if we do flood, it'll, it'll dry out much more quickly. So the elevation-based measures are usually the, the, the go-to approach if we're trying to m extrapolate what sea level rise is gonna do to our community. Um, or again, say planning for Hurricane uh, Ivan or, or Harvey or something like that. So that, th th those, that's the science, th those are the scientist ways of doing it, right? Then the other way to measure the coastal zone is to use an arbitrary uh, definition most typically, that's to use some political unit, some political boundary, some geographic thing created for a completely different purpose, say a state, say a county, say a voting district. Um, and it turns out those are the ones we use the most because we have those things, right? And also because historically we've set up our data collection, like our U.S. Census and things like that, based around these political boundaries. So pretty much these things cause all kinds of problems and headaches and it's again they don't talk to each other well etc. Um, they were invented before we had GIS um, and uh, and they suck for pretty much everything except getting data. They, they, they're a little bit easier to get data than for these other things. These other things because we don't collect data necessarily on distance from the coast you have to do some slicing and dicing and, it, and it's a little bit a uh, little bit problematic. Let's talk about Looking globe-wise, what are some common definitions or what are some common ways people define the coastal zone? I know this is a super exciting lecture right now. You guys are, I'm just talking and you're listening, so sorry about that. Questions so far? Okay. All right. So here are um, just some of the ones. Now, this, this, you know, if I gave this talk to certain audiences, they'd be really pissed at me right now. Common, like, it's not common. But... As someone that reads the literature, I'll just say these are, you see these things pop up fairly frequently. So one would be um, these so-called low elevation coastal zone measures. And that's usually something where we're talking about something on the order of 10 meters or lower in terms of absolute elevation. So people that, and, and the example of this would be folks in, in deltas, river deltas, um, farming on the Oxnard Plain, people particularly vulnerable to hurricanes, things like that. So low elevation coastal zone measures are increasingly popular. You'll see a lot of this in the climate change literature, in the coastal adaptation literature. People talk about 
uh, LEC, supposed so-called LECZs. That's one definition. The next is, uh, and I shouldn't, and this is probably becoming obvious to you guys, the part on the ocean is easy. It's the part on land that we all get, get pissy about and, and want to slice and dice it because that's where we tend to live, right? We tend to just float across the ocean and not spend a huge amount of time there. We reside, we put, we put way more structures on land. We have legs instead of fins. So that's why most of the energy here is focusing on the terrestrial side of the coastal equation. But the, another one is something like a, a simple 100 kilometer. How many people live within 100 kilometers of the coast? Uh, somewhat less so popular, uh, 50 kilometer uh, uh, buffer. Um, and I know I just flagged this for those of you that are, are GIS types and might be interested in doing stuff with this in the future. Um, this sounds really easy. It's actually not, it, it gets very complex when we try to do a global perspective. You have to use the proper projection for each region or each country. And, and that um, can lead to huge problems if you don't do that when you get to places like Iceland, et cetera. In the last couple of years, I see more and more references to 10 kilometer buffers. And people sometimes, not always, but they sometimes refer to those as the immediate coastal zone. So this old definition of coastal zone, people have, are increasingly starting, and we'll see this some examples in, in a little bit, but, but um, there's, there's the coastal zone and there's the coastal zone. You know what I'm saying? This is kind of like, well, this is the one I really want to talk about. Oftentimes people talk about a 10 kilometer um, buffer. Another, com another uh, key way people will express the coastal zone and, and, and the activity in the coastal zone is with population density, not just the absolute number of people, but, but how concentrated are those folks? How many people per unit area, per square kilometer, per, per square mile, what have you? I should also say that in our class, we, whenever possible, we default to using the real metrics, which would be, uh, you know, kilometers, meters, grams, stuff like that. But in the management world, not everybody does that. So in our restoration work, nobody ever talks about, you know, square kilometers. Everybody talks about feet and inches and stuff. So sometimes we're, you'll see me reference things like miles, et cetera. I don't like to do that. But, but because so much of the literature and the stuff you'll read still uses some of these old, uh, these, these old American ways of talking about distance and weight and measure and everything, um, that's why I use them. But whenever you can, you guys should always be defaulting towards the adult terminology, things based on the power of 10 as opposed to 12 and weird things like that. So uh, population density is a key thing. Another, another proxy that uh, is often used or, or is commonly used would be this notion of the proportion of the coastal population that's living in an urban area. So the people next to the coast that are in some type of city. It, 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 it's, it's a proxy for population density, the one above, which can be harder to measure because of data issues. But also it, it, it's, it's something of an al another way to talk about how hardened is our coast, how, how impervious, how developed, how, how trapped has much of our coastal zone become. With the idea that there's more, more people in urban areas the more concrete, the more impervious surfaces, the more problem for water exchanging, et cetera. Okay, so low elevation coastal zones, 100 kilometer buffer, 10 kilometer buffer, and this notion of density in urban, uh, people in urban areas. Okay, now we're to the US. Um, we have a couple different ways of doing it here. Or, well, well, we have more than a couple. We have a lot of different ways. But I would say, to, as an introduction for you guys, it's probably easiest to think of county-based definitions of the coastal zone. Unless we're in Louisiana, then we have to say parishes, but Louisiana's weird, so we'll save that for later. Um, but uh, county-based measures, what we consider the water part of the equation, and then just, again, the arbitrary political definition, blah, blah, blah. So the county-based stuff, um, you'll hear uh, two common things. One would be a coastal watershed county. This would be a county that touch, that, that is wholly within or, or partly within a, a watershed that drains immediately to the coast. And then we could talk about coastal shoreline counties. These would be counties that only touch the water. So again, like we said, the sort of the, the directly affected and the sort of less, less intense uh, area of the coastal zone. It, for most of our talking, if we talk about California, we don't know this, this next one doesn't really matter too much for us, but it does, 
And the reason I bring all these things up is because when you guys start to go look for your own factoids about what's the coastal population, whatever, you really need to know the methodology they use. Are they using a distance-based thing? Are they using an elevation-based measure? Are they using a combination of the two, what have you? And one of the um, ones that, that causes the biggest uh, confusion and, and messes people's numbers up is are we talking about the shoreline that is touching salt water or are we talking about so-called inland seas, which in our country, the Great Lakes would be part of that. So for much of our coastal planning, we consider the coastal states and the Great Lakes and the Great Lake states as all coastlines. And th there's, some, there's some good reasons for that. Some of the issues, those lakes are vast. Some of them have share similar challenges in terms of maritime safety and, and, and harbors and things like that. But in other things, such as international trade and stuff, mm, maybe, maybe not. So, um, so realize we can, we can define them either way. And then again, the, the, the most common ones that you'll find, the easiest ones for you guys to find, would be the arbitrary ones, such as ones we create, that we created in Ventura here for doing some sea level rise estimations, or something like the California Coastal Act, which we'll talk a little bit about more in a second which is a political definition for what the coastal zone is. You guys doing good? This is a boring lecture. This is, this is a lot of sitting, not a lot of talking. Okay, every stretch. Okay, so um, for example, we can, we can look at, uh, to get into this, we can start talking about some of our US coastal counties. This is some data from a 2010 paper that, that once I have the folders up, you guys can look at. <laughs> um, but this is a publication for the US Census and uh, the way the census defines things, of our only 254 counties out of our more than 3,000 counties uh, touch a coastline. And that equates to about 8% of the total number, 8% uh, of all the possible counties. Or if we go by area, it's 16% of the area of the U.S. So however you slice it, it's a fraction, it's a fraction of the total. And, uh, but but so by harbor, I, maybe I should fix that slide. But I, I don't mean like an ocean harbor. I mean, but they they contain. Okay. So those guys. Sorry. I, I, yeah, that's probably confusing since we're talking about ocean and coast and stuff. Uh, so delete. <laughs> just just I got to change the slides. It touch saltwater colon is what I should say. Okay. So um so either eight percent or sixteen percent depending on however you want to slice it, but have about a third of the people. And when we talk about these urban areas, for example, uh, half of our largest cities, of our 10 largest cities, are in those, one of those counties. And 70% of our most populous counties are in that zone. So again, small area of the coastal zone, disproportionate use, disproportionate packing of people, economic activity, et cetera, into there. Okay, a little bit about the bureaucracy of how we define this, and we'll come back to this again because this is an important topic for our class, but um, the mother of all things, well, we'll hear about the Coastal Zone Management Act, but, but the, the true mother of all things started here in California. It's called the California Coastal Commission, and that was really the thing that birthed the modern thinking of coastals, how, how we manage stuff in the coast. How do we do things better? How do we do things more judiciously? Etc. This, now we normally get PO'd every voting time because we have dozen, uh, sometimes dozens of propositions. Like, I don't know if this dude should be jailed or not. I don't know about, like, dude, why don't you politicians do your job? Why are you asking me? I got to go to school. I got to do all this, right? The proposition tool that we have in our state is very powerful. It was created back when people were very worried that a small group of wealthy, powerful folks were running things. Sound familiar? Um, in that case, it was the, it was the railroads and, and, and the robber barons and this and that. And so the notion was we wanted to create a direct action, a tool that we could, um, that if, if the powerful get too crazy, we can exert that. And, and one might say that that's gotten a little out of hand in recent years and decades. But it's important for you guys to know that that is how the Coastal Commission was birthed. It didn't start with the legislature. It started with the people. Started in 1972. What else happened around 1972? Clean Water Act. Clean Water Act. 
right? Clean Water Act, 1973. What else? That's for the federal level. EPA started, right? So Nixon starts the EPA. We have the Clean Water Act. We have the Clean Air Act. We have the Endangered Species Act. Santa Barbara oil spill, 1969. Cuyahoga River catches on fire. What's that? MPAs come on a little bit later. MPAs are more like in 1980s, and they really get going in the 1990s. But this is really the birth, the, the late 60s, early 70s, the birth of what we consider now the modern environmental legislative era. Modern environmental groups, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, this whole thing. And people start looking around going, dude, the rivers are not supposed to be on fire. I, I don't know a lot, but I know the water shouldn't be burning, right? Santa Barbara, will, again, we'll talk about this uh, in future classes, but you know, the ocean shouldn't be dumping oil onto my beach all the time, and then when we clean off the oil, it shouldn't come back the next day. Like, that's something messed up. So that really spurred, and pollution was a key part of the concerns there, but not the only, not the only concern by any means. But, but basically, people got together. They put together this proposition. It was Proposition 20. They passed it in 1972, before you guys were born. I was born, but most of you guys weren't born then. Um, and then, crazy, 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 four years later, the, the legislature was like, that's a good idea, we're going to do that. So then they passed their own law, the California Coastal Act, that essentially codified all that stuff and put it in the state constitution. So the California Coastal Commission that gets a lot of, um, a lot of uh, garners a lot of attention and people scream about, you know, da 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 da, -da trampling on rights and and you're not doing enough, and you're doing too much, and all this and that. The United Nations has called it the most powerful land management agency in the world, which is saying something when you look at all the whole world, right? So California Coastal Commission, incredibly powerful. We'll, we'll, this, this requires much more time than this intro lecture, but suffice it to say, that's really important. What I want to touch on in the context of our definition of the coastal zone, though, is that um, we have this thing called Coastal Zone Management Act, again, more of that later, which is a federal, which is a federal structure by which we manage our, uh, the coastal zone. The entity that we do that through is this thing called the California Coastal Management Program, which really does nothing. It just sort of passes through the stuff through by, by the most part. There are three entities that do all the dirty work in the coastal zone in our state. The Coastal Commission, which is the, the you know, grandmother of all these guys, that's the one that, that's the entity that allows development, that permits, can we put this pier in? Can we not put this pier in? If your house is in the coastal zone, can I, can I expand my house? All, all that kind of stuff. And a whole lot more. But in the context of today's discussion, they regulate development. We also have within the, the San Francisco Bay area, we have the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. They do the same thing just in the interior area of San Francisco Bay. And then we have, it sounds confusing, not the California Coast Commission, but the California Coastal Conservancy. Right. So don't confuse the California Coastal Commission and the California Coastal Conservancy. So the commission has, a, has political appointees and they vote and they make decisions all the time. They have, they have staff and other folks too, but, but their main activity is they, they decide what's allowed, what's not allowed. The Coastal Conservancy, they're the nice people. They buy land, they restore things, they, they, they put in a pass so we can get down to the beach to have public access, that kind of stuff. So they're, they're a, a, an entity that deals with improving the resources, basically managing the resources. Okay, so that's the stage. And then here is your, uh, in pink, here is your uh, California, actually, sorry, pink on the landward side, purple on the ocean side. This is your California coastal zone, legally defined. If we, if we, if we want to talk about what the law says is the coastal zone, this is what it is in California. So uh, this is a legislature defined area, meaning it's going to be screwed up done by non-technical people, backroom deals. What if we do this? What if we do that? So we have the boundary that we have, and that's it. So it might be problematic. It might make us angry. It might, might be unfair, but it's what it is. Also, we should note this was done before GIS. So this was, again, the, the 70s that this, that this was um, happening. 
Our coastal zone in California varies, which is why it's so, it makes things so complex. So it can be anywhere from just a few hundred feet, like a tenth of a mile, to as far inland as five miles on the terrestrial side of things. The oceanic side, it's always three miles. So, so the ocean, again, the oceanic side's easy, okay, whatever, going out into the ocean. The terrestrial zone varies, the, and it doesn't exactly follow this rule, but it, it sort of follows this rule more times than not, which is the areas where we don't have a, we didn't have in the 70s a heavily urbanized area. We're gonna go inland till we hit the first big mountain ridge. Or five miles for mean high or high water. And whichever one of those is less, we'll, we'll go with that. In the urban areas, it's basically just hug the coast. Hug the coast as tightly as you can. Because the, urban, the, the city of LA, San Francisco, all those folks were like, screw you, we're not adding, an, adding another layer of bureaucracy onto us, right? And, and, there, and there, there are other reasons too. This wasn't just cynical and, and messed up like that. Many people were saying, man, LA is screwed, right? Or for better or worse, LA's having the impacts that it's having that urban area on our ocean, on, our, on, on the sea, let's say. But the Santa Monica Mountains, hey, they're not totally done yet. We could maybe influence some development decisions that would influence erosion, whatever it is. And so, so there are also reasons to, to treat the potentially, theoretically, treat the developed areas and the lesser developed areas, the more developed and lesser developed areas, somewhat differently. At least that's, that's what made sense to people at the time. And then again, just to note, um, because it's a political thing, normally we would, when in our conceptual definition of the coastal zone, that we go into San Francisco Bay, we go into Mission Bay in San Diego, we don't care. But operationally, legally here, the stuff inside San Francisco Bay does, is not covered by the coastal act. It's not considered coastal zone um, and does not have to ascribe to some of the restrictions and permitting issues that, uh, that we do elsewhere. So if we zoom in a little bit, you can see this more closely. So here we are. So here I've mushed together uh, our local area. So Santa Barbara County, Ventura, LA, and have a look, right? So some of these areas in the Santa Monica Mountains, right, we're going five miles in. So here the coastal zone goes from the, the waterline all the way in. And so those Malibu mansions, if they want to expand something, they have to, it has to comply with, with the Coastal Act. It has to comply with the, what's called the local coastal plan or, or, or the permitted actions. If you want to do something different than that, you have to go get a special permit, generally speaking, which is why they renovate and don't do new de novo construction that much. You could be, uh, you know, and so maybe, you, maybe your mansion is four miles inland, but dude, you're in the coastal zone, right? Here, maybe you're a half mile, if you're on Palos Verdes Peninsula or Manhattan Beach or wherever it is, maybe you're a half mile in and you're like, I'm gonna knock this house down, build a new house. Like, no worries, right? You're, you're, not, you're not held to those same development uh, requirements, et cetera. Channel Islands are like, screw that, put, all, put everything in the coastal zone. Right? So, um, and then again, here's this, the same shot with just, a, this is, I've, I've mushed together the maps from, um, from the Coastal Commission's website. And you can see that the same idea, but just with a little bit more of our roads and stuff, so it makes it a little more um, perhaps easy to see how, how much this goes inland, how much it doesn't go inland depending on where we are. So again, it makes for, politically, it makes for a challenge, right? Because it, it's already set up to look like, well, this is biased against some people or biased to help some and, and hurt others, et cetera. But uh, just as some contrasting examples, that's our, that's our California example. Let's look at a couple quick examples from other places in the states. Uh, let's look at Louisiana. So Louisiana, they manage there. Uh, just like we have a California uh, management program, they have theirs. Theirs was approved a little bit after ours. Their coastal zone varies anywhere from 16 to 32 miles inland. Louisiana, pancake. California, up down. California, new, geologically young. We're the hip happening people, right? Louisiana is the old, degraded, super eroded part of the continent. <clears throat> so it's very flat, very pancakey. 
And so um, you can, as we're seeing with these hurricanes and storm surge and stuff, a little teeny bit of elevation, you can go way far inland. And so, and so that's reflected in the width of their coastal zone, huge coastal zone. Um, this is on the order of about um, not quite half of all of our coastal wetlands in the U.S. are in Louisiana. So one of the reasons we do a lot of work on wetlands in Louisiana with our friends there is because it is such an amazing, um, uh, incredible, awesome coastal wetland that we're um, doing everything we possibly can to destroy as fast as possible. But that's, again, another conversation for later. Um, we can talk about North Carolina. North Carolina, uh, again, th their, theirs was uh, um, a little bit earlier approved at the federal level than, than Louisiana. But again, they have their uh, entities that, that uh, do the permitting, et cetera. They have a Coastal Area Management Act that passed in 75. They tried to do one um, just in the wake of ours in 1972, and, it, and, the, and the politicians are like, yeah, no, 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 no. Nip, 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 nip. So it took a while and they changed things around. Check out how these guys in North Carolina define their coastal zone. They say a coastal zone is a coastal county. That's their unit of it is or it isn't. And, they, and their, and, and so, so that's their definition of coastal county, coastal county. But then within that, see if this sounds familiar to you yet, they have, they have a two tier system. So they have this sort of direct. The, the, the you know, most intense area right next to the coast, which they call areas of environmental concern. And, and that would be things like the beach, things like the coastal estuary, stuff like that. But then if you have a large county and you go farther back and you're out of that area, then we have these other areas that, you know, they come into our planning, but we're not quite as worried about them as we are about the really immediate fringe around the shoreline. So this notion of, yes, we're using counties, but we're trying to um, uh, acknowledge that there's a difference between this area right on the beach and this other area that might be 50 miles away from, from uh, the beach. So California, Louisiana, North Carolina, different examples of how we might, uh, not how we might, how we do define the coastal zone in different areas of our country. <coughs> So here are the coastal counties in the 50 states. We also have, of course, our territorial uh, holdings, and, and there's those to consider too. But for now, we're just going to talk about states. And so, so there you go. So here are our coastal counties. And you can see that um, some of them are, are quite thin and, and um, uh, proximate to the ocean. Others, like in, say, Alaska or in Oregon, they can reach pretty far inland. And there's a couple reasons for that. First and foremost, the eastern seaboard was the place where our country, uh, the modern U.S., obviously began. And so political units are much smaller and tighter as we, as we progress farther and farther across the western landscape and, and get to other places. It's much more raw. It's much more, oh, this area. So the, and so the political units, on average, tend to get larger and larger compared to the eastern seaboard. Okay, so here's my question. My question is... Um, so of these coastal counties, right, so pretty much you guys can probably think of them all, but you know, they're, they're all areas of our country. Which coastal counties grew the most over the last 50 odd years? So I want a list that's the, just the total number of, you know, which ones grew the most in terms of just raw numbers of people being added to them. And then which ones grew the most in terms of proportional difference? Okay, those are our votes. Okay, so let's take a look at the answers. Nice. So, uh, have a look at this here. So this is, this is 1960, 2008. This is the change. So this one here, it, the top numbers are the change in the gross quantity, and then this is the proportion. So, how did we fare? Well, of, of, your, of you guys have your list. You guys have your list. So are your top three on, on here? No, 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 yeah. Okay, so you guys got the number okay? Yeah. What about proportion? No. <laughs> we uh, did not use that. And a couple people are going to Alaska. Okay, so one of the things we're doing in our class as we're reading all these papers and things, in addition to all the learning about coastal management and everything, you guys are also working on interpreting data. You guys will be generating graphs and stuff later on. 
But so I want you guys to stare at this for a minute or two, and I want you to, to do some interpretation for me. So look at this and, and tell me what pattern you see in here. Just to, your, to yourself first. First, look for a second, then we'll talk about it. Right, a lot of Florida. Uh huh, totally. So, a lot of this area, a lot of this area or this area. Okay. So, de definitely what people might refer to as the Sun Belt, right? Where all everybody, everybody's retiring to as, as, as our population, uh, baby boomers age and get to retirement age. They're all old people and they don't like to walk and they're cold, so they go where it's warm. Okay. Unfortunately, they go to where it's warm and there's a lot of hurricanes and it's hard to evacuate when you can't move fast, but that's another, <laughs> that's another story. It's another story. Okay. Uh, so that's one pattern. Any, any other one or any other observations? Oh, sorry. I'm Matt. So with the, uh, with the raw change in uh -huh. people, you know, these are just big cities getting bigger. This could that's right. be explained by birth rates. Sure. But with percent change, these are tiny counties exploding, which almost certainly cannot be explained by birth rates. And that's right. People Excellent. So, so to be sure, this is there's a lot of stuff buried in here, right? And I'm, we're just looking at one table. So, uh, Matt's right that all these things: immigration, emigration, birth rate, death rate. This is census data. So, this is people that wanted to be counted, right? So, folks that may be undocumented or homeless or other the, the problems enumerating some parts of our uh, country and um, but nevertheless but, but, so there's all those sort of subtle things going on as we get to the six million seven million ten million those concerns not so much are, are, are not as big a deal whereas the county with 10,000 people if we forget to if we somehow miscount 500 people that's a that's a much bigger deal right it also speaks to um, the fact that in the 1960s we're still in the post-World post War, 1960, excuse me, we're still in the post-World War II era, um, and there's still, uh, the regulations for development aren't quite the same, and, and all those things, it's a lot easier to, you know, in those years, um, move and start a farm or, or, a, or an airport or whatever it is in an empty lot, as it were, as opposed to a big urbanized development area, developed area. So is all that going on? Absolutely. And you can, we can dig into this and look at all that. Um, and, and clearly the greatest percent changes are the guys that started with nothing and then became moderate size, right? That's, you're proportionally going. But this also speaks to one of the key things you guys all need to stay abreast of in these debates. People will often use these two um, approaches to their end. So depending on who's making the argument and what the particular argument is, some will really, really emphasize the, the gross number, the value. Others will say, oh, so for example, right now, Hurricane Harvey is a, is a big thing. How are we going to recover this area? The elected representatives from Texas that famously, 20 of them, voted against Hurricane Sandy relief they, they're not talking about how many billions. They're not talking about the quantity of dollars it will need, they will need to rebuild the Houston and the, and the greater Houston area. They talk about proportions. Well, you know, relatively speaking, it's not so bad, right? We have an oil spill. We have an oil spill. Uh, environmentalists or, or whoever will, might say, this is five times the Exxon Valdez or Valdez, right? And then the company that spilled the oil might say, oh, it's only, uh, they, won't, they won't say gallons, that's a big number, they'll say barrels, because a barrel is 42 gallons. It's only like 5,000 barrels, right? So, so and I'm not saying that to demonize anyone, I'm just saying you guys need to stay abreast of that, and that really can change the picture, right? Is Collier County the, the fastest growing county, or is LA County the fastest growing county? There, there's an honest argument for both. Right, but you have to, you know, dig a little bit deeper into those into the, to that data to actually get a sense of, of uh, what's going on. Cool. 
All right, well, let's, let's have a look. So where does California, let's, let's stick to California. Proportionally speaking, California doesn't even show up anywhere in the proportion of changes. Florida really dominates the, the proportional changes, right? But when we talk about gross numbers, LA County, Orange County, San Diego County, Santa Clara County, these are all ones you guys had. Contra Costa County, where I went to high school. Ventura County, where we live. Alameda County, um, right? All, all of these, you know, California dominates in terms of the numbers, as you, as you would expect, because we are the most populous state. So that, that's not that surprising. Cool? All right. Any other observations or questions? Okay, cool. Um, we, we talked about another one of our proxies, or, 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 or excuse me, not proxies, but measures of the coastal zone and talk about pressures or whatever, is this notion of urbanized uh, or, or the amount of urban uh, areas in the area next to the coast. So here, let's look at this for a second. This is um, evidence that our coastal zone is increasingly urbanized. Our co at least the terrestrial side of our coastal zone is increasingly hardened increasingly impervious. So have a look. Right. So in the coastal areas, it was, it was 86% in, uh, in an urban area. So still, most of them are in urban area. 13 or 14% here or outside. Now it's only 4%, right? So 95.6% so of the folks in a coastal counties or a coastal county are living in a in an urbanized area whereas outside but in in the area in the midwest say whatever it urban areas are still where the majority of people live but we go from four percent living outside the metro outside of urbanized areas to almost a, a fifth of the people living outside the the broad patterns humans moving to urban areas maybe urban areas expanding that's going on across the planet but it's more intensely felt in the coastal zone. Yeah? So while, again, these things, coastal zone, urbanized, aren't exactly the same thing, at a gross level, they're, you know, the, 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 by and large, they can give us some rough idea as one goes up, the other uh, goes up. Yeah? So you can look at this, for example. So here is, um, this is data from uh, what's called a place three, which is a, uh, data set you guys could download and play with if you want to um, but basically this is uh, the the world and the dot each little red dot indicates an area of a lot of people and that is at least 5,000 people living in that little red area it could be could be more than that and how we pick those areas is based on nighttime illumination so we take take a satellite, fly it over, turn the camera down, take a picture at night, and look at the illuminated area as the starting spot. And then you go down, you overlay um, census data, et cetera, on there. Again, this shows that pattern we talked about, right? The coastal zone is over-enriched. For as thin and, and, and small an area as it is, we're over-enriched in red dots. The red dots are not randomly distributed across the terrestrial landscape. They're clustered. Here is uh, raw population density. So now we're, we're leaving the urban story to the side for a second. So this is, this is just number of people in 2010. And uh, the hotter the color, the darker the color, the more people per um, square kilometer. And so what's the pattern you see there? Is it, is it, is it same, different than the cities? Yeah, grossly similar, grossly similar, right? So, so it's true, there's people all over the place, we cover the planet, but, um, and you can see this most clearly in Asia. When we get closer and closer to the coast, that's where everybody wants to be. Asia is the basket case for climate change. That's where right now, we're having these, these intense monsoons and we don't have, so far as of today, 60 people have died, the most official estimate in Harvey. We're talking tens of thousands of people died last week in India, Bangladesh, um, 
probably getting closer to hundreds of thousands or, or getting close to 100,000 people have died, right? They don't have much freeboard to deal with rising seas when the majority of the population lives a foot or so above mean high or high water, right? So, okay, so, so here, here's population, just raw, or raw population density, I should say. Here is a boundary. Now, this is, the, what I'm showing you here is, this is a, a generous boundary, more generous than we typically use. This is the 200, this is 200 kilometers in from the coastline, from the shoreline. And all I'm gonna do right now is delete all the other stuff and have a look at it. So again, here's that same data, here's the density of people, and here, and so this is this is density of people right in the within 200 kilometers of the coast. Again, you can see, yeah, we have some problems in North America, of course. Florida screwed. Um, you know, some of Northern Europe is really, really hard, potentially hard hit, etc. There, there's there's problem areas all around, but on with the with the possible exception of Oceania, all our small island Pacific, uh, uh, you know, small uh, island nations in the Pacific which have very little, some of them have very little topographic relief, exception to those guys, the big basket case for climate change is Asia. For as problematic as that's gonna be for our friends on South Pacific Islands, not to be cruel, but we're talking, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. In Asia, we're talking hundreds of millions to billions of people. So when people talk about coastal management, why does it matter? Sea level rise, why does it matter? It matters a huge, a whole hell of a lot if we want to be avoiding suffering of human beings, if we want to be preserving our natural resources, if we want to be avoiding outright war. Um, these things are ma properly managing these things, properly dealing with this stuff, not sticking our heads in the sand and saying that's not true, right? That doesn't help anybody, right? So, so this is, this is a, perhaps one of the, the best arguments you can have that we should be serious about dealing with things like climate change, things like coastal zone management, et cetera, because this is where we live and this is where the stressors are going to be. And as we've seen with Katrina, as we've seen with Sandy, as we've seen with Harvey, as we've seen with all these things, um, the events will be precipitated most likely by an unplanned event, a, a, a storm, some crazy guy with an atomic bomb, something, something weird like that. And then all of these planning things get much more complicated and, and the situations become much more constrained. We want to get ourselves out, dig ourselves out as fast as we can before we get to those crisis times. All right, uh, get near the end here. So this is, this is uh, the most recent sort of holistic assessment from our government. This is from 2013. Um, this is where we sit. So uh, again, let's have a look right here. So this is, um, this is using 2010 data. Again, how it works, just so we're all on the same page, how it works with our census data, we only count people every 10 years. If you go to the US Census Bureau's website right now, you will find numbers for this year, last year, next year, but those are estimates. They're, they're not bad estimates, but they're estimates. We only truly enumerate once every 10 years. So, so it's, yeah, so just know that when, we, when you're looking at numbers that aren't 2010 or 2020 or 2030 or 1970 or whatever, those are, those are estimates based on the previous years or the previous census's stuff. So this is using our most recent census data, which is 2010. And again, uh, the, so you, now you know what we mean by coastal shoreline counties, coastal watershed counties. We're talking that they're only either 10% of the total land of the uh, U.S. or 20%, but yet they account for either uh, about 40% of all the people or 52% of all the people if we talk about coastal watershed counties. Again, density of people is highest, if we're looking across the nation, in the immediate right next to the coastal zone. 446 people per square mile, again, per square mile, because it's, you know, silly, silly Americans. Um, and then the U.S. overall is only about one-fourth as dense as our coastal zone. And, and again, if we look back through time, not only are these patterns, you know, consistent, but 
but the look at the rate of change for all counties. We're, we're more people in every county, but we're we're going up at this at this rate. Whereas here, we're adding people faster and faster, right? So we're adding 125 over this 40-year period. We added 125 people per square mile, whereas in the U.S. overall, only 36 people per square mile. So the coastal counties have more people, have greater density, all this kind of stuff, and it's going up faster in our coastal zone. Yeah? Okay. And then um, just a, a little example here why, why this matters. And this is something, and when, I, when I have these resources up, you guys can play with this. We'll probably do this later in the semester. But so this is one example um, using counties. Again, our arbitrary definition for what the coastal zone is. But we can, but you know, again, because this is the most uh, abundant data, we oftentimes will, are forced into doing this. But this is a great visual, visualization that was done uh, by Climate Central with various uh, US government um, data sets. Some of our data sets have become um, less obvious where they are in the last few months because of some decisions at the federal government to, to um, uh, make some of this information harder for you to get to. But, um, but suffice it to say, this, this data uses government data, but it's on a, a um, non-government server, so you can play with it all day long. It's not going to go away. But in this case, let me, let me kill these lights totally because these might be a little dark. Okay, so this is uh, obviously the state of California. And this is um, uh, a really uh, cool tool called, called the Risk Finder. And this is looking at counties that have, or, or the amount of people in our various counties that have folks that were the sea level to increase one foot above mean high, the average sea level rise one foot above mean high or higher water, how many of those people, their, their houses basically would be, um, would be harmed? Would, would their houses be you know, underwater or, or, or inundated? And so, um, and, and so again, the, the more intense the color, the more people. And then uh, with this, with this guy, so this is just the, the gross number, the gross scale. And then this number down here says for this level, which counties are the most screwed? Which counties have the greatest number of people at risk from flooding? And I should say this, if you, if you look down here on this key caveat, they exclude areas protected by levees. That's a dangerous thing. We'll talk about levees later. But this is assuming that all the protections that we have in place are gonna work. Here's a little secret, they won't all work. So the same entities that built the levees in New Orleans certified our levees here in Ventura County, Merry Christmas. They also certified our levees in the San Francisco Delta where we get about one third of our water supply for our county, Merry Christmas, right? So uh, it's all the same folks doing this. So, um, okay, so let's have a look at this. So here we go, so this is one foot, so th the population in the coastal zone, coastal county, that could be a, that could be harmed by a one foot rise in sea level, one foot. And so San Mateo is the most uh, uh, problematic county when we start with. Here's two foot. Here's three foot. So LA starts coming in here at three foot. Three foot. Again, I don't want to get into too much climate change stuff yet, but. But uh, suffice it to say, three foot is the default, what everybody's talking about, by 2100. Every single one, or, or, or almost every single one of our predictions for climate change have been way too conservative. Way too conservative. So a new paper that just came out last year said that three level rise should at least be six foot rise. And some model shows higher than that. So. The point of this tool is not to say what exactly is going to happen. It's just to help you guys start to visualize what if, so we can start to do what if scenarios. Okay, so, so this, is, this is three foot. Here's four foot. Here's five foot. So San Mateo, bad times. They seem to really <laughs> always be very blue. Six foot, again, the new prediction for end of the century. 
Seven foot. Eight foot. Nine foot. Ten foot. And this simulation only goes up to ten feet, so um, which is which is probably fine. Um, but check it out. So in the, in the top five problem areas, San Diego, Orange County, those maybe weren't in our first thinking of this, right? In the first one foot. And, and, and look at this. If we were to have a 10, and again, I, I'm, I, we're not going to have 10 foot sea level rise tomorrow. I'm not trying to say that. But, but just to have a look, right? You can see that tools like this can really help. So even these simple definitions of what the coastal zone is can really be help be helpful to managers that are talk, trying to manage risk. Okay, yes, there's a lot of assumptions here. Yes, we didn't fully model all the possible this and that, but but let's talk about relatively speaking, where should we putting where should we be putting our resources? Which counties are going to need the most help? Which which municipalities need to need to be thinking about this that haven't thought about it at all? Who's got the generators in the basement still? Um, a couple last examples here. So, uh, for example, the UN tends to use, when the UN does coastal zone pro uh, projections, and the UN tends to do it for most of the world, right? The US, we tend to focus on our country, but the UN is one of the default places when we talk about what, what's, what's the situation going on at the global scale. They tend to use, on average, not always, but they tend to use both the shoreline and the elevation distance. Again, the, the distance inland, how many people are there in that coast zone, that's, that's usually an estimate of pressure. How much are we impacting the resources? And then the elevation data is some measure of risk, vulnerability. So they, they oftentimes will use both, not always, oftentimes use both. So for example, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, um, they use 100 kilometers or, or closer to the shore and a 50 meter elevation um, 50, 50, meter, 50 meters uh, rise in elevation. Um, another, some of the reports by um, uh, McGranan and others, um, they used just an elevational uh, measure. Because again, those guys were mostly, in, in that case, that study was mostly about vulnerability to sea level rise. So they were mostly concerned about who was low to the ground, close to the ocean surface. Um, Okay, so to the stuff I told you at the start, we'll just wrap up. So again, most of our large cities are on the coast. Uh, the density of people is the greatest at the coastal zone. We have these things that you sometimes hear referred to as the, the, the seaboard, the eastern seaboard, the Atlantic seaboard, etc., which are basically an, an, a, you know, all the counties next door to each other. Really intense concentration of economic and social activity. Um, the, the drivers, we haven't gotten this this lecture, but the drivers of these things are typically different, different migration patterns, et cetera, the coast versus inland. Um, we have more people alive today in just our coastal zone, however we want to define that, than were alive in the 1950s on the whole planet. So all of 1950s jammed in next to the water. That translates into something on the order of about a billion human beings worldwide. In the US, we're, we're somewhere between 120 and 140 million people in our coastal zone right now. A lot of folks. And, and that's on the order of about 40% uh, of the US population lives in the coastal zone or a coastal county.